welcome to Coffee Time again, exposing the truth. Bill at the microphone, a show that demonstrates how history repeats itself. He digs into the past, shows what happens, and how it is happening now. Follow the path of history to where it goes, then relate it to today to reveal the connections. The culture that forgets its history has no future. A history buff and loves to talk about it going back as far as ancient Greeks and Egyptians and beyond. So grab your coffee, your chair, and listen to the show. Hope you enjoy. I'd like to introduce you to Vic. He's a retired New York City Police Department official, officer, and he's worked uh, several different departments, and I'd like to introduce him, and he can introduce himself to you now. Vic, join us in and tell us about you, briefly about yourself. Hi, Dale. Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me on my show. I appreciate it. My name is Vic Ferrari. I'm a retired 20-year member of the New York City Police Department. My last 10 years, I was a detective. I'm a Bronx kid, grew up in a lower middle-class family in the Bronx, always wanted to be a police officer, specifically the New York City Police Department. I like to tell the story. When I was 10 years old, my friends and I used to sneak into the post office and steal the FBI wanted posters off the wall and go around the neighborhood having manhunts <laughs> looking for bad guys. And it was probably funny to see a bunch of 10-year-olds walking around with wanted posters going into the local deli, trying to, <laughs> trying to line up a guy wanted for a bank robbery in Louisiana and some poor, a and a some poor telephone repairman guy trying to get a sandwich in a deli. Um, I knew what I wanted to do early in life. You know, I watching growing up in New York, watching all the television shows about the New York City Police Department. By five, 10 years old, I knew what I wanted to do. By 20, I took the exam. By 21, I was in the police academy and I had a wonderful 20 year career. I worked in a lot of different units, everything from plain clothes, pickpockets. Um, I worked in the narcotics division. And uh, my last 10 years, I was a detective in the NYPD's auto crime division. So anything with chop shops, um, stolen cars, exporting stolen cars out of the country, changing vehicle identification numbers on stolen cars for resale, identity theft, we were involved in. And uh, after I retired from the NYPD, I've, I've got into writing books. I've written a series of books, four of which are a behind the scenes look into the New York City Police Department. Those are the ones I'm interested in is the books. I'm sorry, Dale? How many books did you, you say you wrote four, four books? I, I've written six, but four yes. about the New York City Police Department. Four. Okay, because I remember when we talked earlier, you had one that you just finished writing. About yeah, I just finished years. writing uh, Confessions of a Catholic High School Graduate. It's about growing up in the Bronx and, uh, <laughs> you know, going to Catholic high school kind of against what I wanted. The book yeah. cover has got a picture of a kid in a Catholic high school uniform getting yeah. chased by a priest. That actually happened to me. You confess one sin too many, it can lead to a foot chase to a church. <laughs> well, I went to a Catholic school in second grade. The nun cracked my knuckles. Oh, yeah. Oh, they were no joke. Well, no joke. I kicked her in the shin with steel toed boots on. Oh, yeah. it's funny when people say, school. well, well, it's funny day. nowadays people, you know, it's a different world, a different culture. And people say, wow, the corporal punishment, they could hit you. And I go, yeah. And they go, well, didn't you tell your parents? I'm like, here's the thing. If I went home and told my parents that brother so-and-so kicked me in the ass or gave me a smack in the mouth for acting up in class, my father would say, what did you do? And I mm -hmm. would have said, what does every kid say? Nothing. I was minding my own business and he just landed on me and smacked me around. And I know what my father would have said. All right, we're going to go to school and we're going to talk to brother so-and-so. If his story is more believable than your story, there's going to be two people getting crucified. So I, why would I do it to myself again? I had already been punished. Why was I going to, you know, why was I going to go home and get punished again? Like I just learned it's over. I, I you know, suck it up, move on with my life. Well, my father would have done the same thing. In fact, as he did after I kicked him. That was my last day at Catholic school. I been was raised in public schools from then on. <laughs> uh, anyway, you wrote a. You showed me a book cover last time about the auto details you worked with and the auto theft the last 10 yeah, years. Uh, yeah, Grand Theft Auto, the yeah, NYPD's auto crime division. Yeah, it's uh, everything you wanted to know about the stolen car industry and was afraid to ask. Yeah. Can I tell my listeners where you can get it so they can listen to it? Or, or yeah, sure. All my books are in paperback. If you go to the Amazon, go to Amazon, go to the book section, just type in Vic, V-I-C, 
Ferrari, like the car. Um, my video, my video, my book library will pop up. All my paperbacks are ten bucks. I try to keep the price point low. Yep. Or if you read eBooks, they're two ninety nine eBook download. Yeah, because I I do eBooks. I do Audible. Okay. So I may go ahead and get it because I mean I, I mean Denver's got a bad reputation for being an auto tech mecca. What what's got a bad uh, rep? Denver. Really? Yeah. So. I did not know that. See, like when in the early '90s, New York City was averaging 150,000 stolen cars a year. So it was like shooting fish in the barrel. Even before I, I became a detective and worked in auto crime, I was always getting involved in car chases because they had just come out with the computer cars, the little terminals. Mm -hmm. So if you sat there and you were punching plates, eventually you were. Gonna, it was just the law of average. It was. It was almost like going to a casino and putting quarters in the slots. You're right. going to hit from time to time, right? So I'd sit there and, you know, bing, the car would come back stolen. And the next thing you know, I'm in a, a car chase. <laughs> that would be interesting in the downtown New York area. Well, I, I never worked in uh, Midtown. Well, you know, here's the thing. New York is five boroughs. Mm -hmm. And I mostly worked in the Bronx and Harlem. So okay. it was a little more wide open spaces than when you're thinking of like Manhattan with the narrow streets. Like, yeah, those guys couldn't get away with what I got away with. Yeah, I was going to say, I seen TV and the traffic for nobody owning any cars in New York City. They seem to have a lot of cars. On yes, the that's, that's very true. But yeah, I'm not familiar with New York. I've already been to Queens once way back in 69, 70. The only time I've been there. I was yeah, in the military changed. and went to see a friend of mine. Yeah, it's, but, it's uh, changed quite a bit. Oh, I'm sure. It's like never. I was gone for 13 years and the whole city changed on me. Can't find, couldn't find my way around the first year I was back. And anyway, you said that you've been a, you wanted to be a cop since you were a kid. Do you know what triggered that or just that you just wanted to be a typical kid? I want to be a policeman. Uh, a little of both, um, but but there was a movie theater around the corner from the local police station. So when my mom would take me to the movies on Saturday, like to see a matinee, I always used to run up to the police cars. Like I just, you know, I used to play cops and rob as a little boy. So yeah. here's a police car. And I would look in, you know, and see the equipment and the nightstick and the hats. And then I started hanging around the police station. I, I would watch how the cops came out of the station house, the way they wear the hat on the back of their head how they would rest their hand on the butt of their guns, like the old 38s with the Sam Brown gun belt. So yeah. like the old gunslingers, you know what I mean? And in the old days before they went to dump pouches and then later speed loaders and then later semi-automatics, the old time cops would have the bullets like exposed on the side of the gun belt, like the bandoleros. They look like, you know, yeah. something like in a Clint Eastwood movie. And I'm like, oh, I want one of those. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I knew yeah. what I wanted just watching those guys. Yeah, because I, I I was on duty with a small police department in, North, in Western Colorado for about five years. City, just patrolling in a mobile home park. We had 300 mobile homes. And that's my whole experience. Well, I know I was deputy sheriff in Orfano County for about six months, but then it says, no, you got to go to school. And I says, I ain't going to no damn school. <laughs> so I got yeah, out. Yeah, now you need college. Um, when I got hired in 87, you didn't need college. Now I think at the very least you need an associate's degree. Yeah. So I became a fireman instead. That it's funny you should say it. A lot of guys, a lot of people do that. Yeah, I did. I became a I was a firefighter for eight years and had a marvelous volunteer. It was great. However, this is about you. So you decided, to, so when he became a police officer, what's it like a day, what, what's a typical day like your first two years after, after the academy? So in New York, things have changed, but back then what they would do is after the academy, they would put you in what was called a field training unit. So we hire in bulk, a small police academy class is 250 cops. We've had classes between 2,500 and 3,000 yeah. graduating, right? So what they do is back then, each borough, uh, so the Bronx had 12 police stations in it or 12 precincts, right? So there were three zones and each zone had four precincts. So what they would do is they put, I, like when I graduated the academy, they put 50 of us in a zone. So I was in zone seven, which was the South Bronx. 
So when you, it was baptism by fire. Like, you know, the police academy, they teach you the rules and regulations, but you don't really know how to deal with people. I mean, and the people in the police academy, they're not street cops. You know what I mean? They're, 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 they're teaching things, you know, that, that don't, that, that aren't applicable, applicable to the street. So in, in field training, they would just sprinkle us, drop us off on foot posts in the South Bronx and tell us, have at it. And I remember, I mean, this is in the middle of the crack epidemic. So like, you know, I'm standing in the South Bronx. I remember my first day, I'm on Fulton Avenue. There's abandoned buildings, burned out abandoned buildings. There's crackheads walking around. I'm saying, what the hell did I just get myself involved in? And people are coming up to me, speaking to me in Spanish. I, I took like remedial Spanish in eighth grade or ninth grade, you know, I didn't know how to have a conversation in Spanish and, you know, you learn. And, uh, and then once in a while, the sergeant would take two of us and throw us in a car and we would go out with the sergeant and respond to different calls like DOAs or domestic violence. And the sergeant was like a guide, like, you know, we would go and, you know, we would talk to people and interact. And if he thought we were making a mistake or had swam out too far, he'd pull us back in. But they really treated you like adults back then. And, and you, there was like no way not, you had to learn. It was, it was just survival. Yeah. I, I've done things like that where they throw you to the walls and say, have fun. Yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty much that's the way it is. Now it's changed. Nowadays, each precinct, each police station gets 10, 20, 30 cops and they break them up into different shifts, but they spoon feed them now. I just don't think that's a good idea. So nowadays the NYPD is so driven by statistics and, and summonses. They'll load eight cops, eight rookie cops in a van with a sergeant and they just drive around and they'll see somebody, you know, doing something ridiculous. The van stops. Everybody gets out to stretch their legs. And the sergeant says, give this guy a ticket or lock him up and throw him in the van. The optics are terrible because the average person doesn't realize what's going on. They see a van with eight cops standing there and they say, well, shouldn't, they, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't these resources be used for something different? Right. And then what happens is after six months, then the rookies, you know, now they're, they're, they're lost, you know, now, now it's like, it's like six months lost because it was, it's almost like, they were spoon fed stuff and, and they really don't know how to think for themselves, but maybe that's by design. I wouldn't have any clue about that. You know, one of the questions that you've listened, what ready to answer 10 questions you were ready to answer at any time. And one that struck out me, cause I just realized what was it like at ground zero at nine 11? Uh, it was wild. Um, I was working that day. I had court. I, my office was in the Bronx, um, about a 45 minute ride through Manhattan to ground zero. And that particular day, I, I, my sergeant and I were going to go down into Manhattan. I had locked this guy up in the past for a couple of stolen cars. He was going to flip and become an informant. So it's called queen for a day where you pull him out of jail and there's a meeting with the defense attorney, um, the prosecutor and you, and you see what he can give you. And if he seems like he's going to, you know, he seems like he can give you fruitful information, you pull him out of jail and he's going to be a confidential informant. Well, I was supposed to be down in Manhattan by 9 a.m. My sergeant was running late. I'm sitting in the office and the first plane hits the tower and uh, someone put on the television. We're watching it like everybody else. The second plane hits and like, oh man, this is terrorism. So what winds up happening is a call comes from downtown and says, everybody get into uniform and stand by. And by 1, 1 30, I mean, me and my, my team of, you know, well, my office was 20 guys, but we met up with the other hundred detectives from auto crime. And by 1, 1 30, we were walking around down there in ground zero. It was, it was like something out of a horror movie. Like you had all this toxic dust and papers and, and just crap flying around the closer you got to ground zero, the darker it got because of all the stuff blowing around in the air. The sunlight couldn't really penetrate it. So it was like a it was like a twilight in broad daylight, if that makes any sense. Everything was covered in that toxic waste. Um, I, I, I tell the story all the time. The one thing that stands out is as the closer we got to it, there were hundreds upon, if not thousands of pairs of women's high heel shoes because you had all these women that worked on Wall Street and the financial district when they were fleeing, they couldn't run in heels. They just took their shoes off and threw them. 
And, you know, we got up to the pile and it was like that scene in Planet of the Apes when Charlton Heston sees the Statue of Liberty head and he goes, oh man, like it all comes together. Like we saw the facade, a, a section of the facade that had fallen thousands of feet and had bedded itself in the sidewalk, like right in front of this tr tremendous pile. And we're just looking at it and we're like, wow, like we just, you know, it's like, I, I felt like a child seeing something that I just couldn't comprehend or understand. Um, you know, by that time I had 13 or 14 years in, so I had seen quite a bit homicides and car accidents and all sorts of stuff, but nothing could have prepared me for, you know, seeing that it just, you know, it just, you felt helpless. You just didn't know what to do. And there really wasn't anything to do. And we went home. I mean, I was there from about one in the afternoon, walking around till about five, six o'clock in the morning, they told us, go home, get a good night's sleep, run your clothes through a washing machine because we think this stuff is toxic. And I was going back doing 12, 13 hour shifts for about the first week. Then they pulled us out. Then they sent us, we were doing the bucket brigade for a while when things kind of cleared up. So we were like ants going up a pile of sugar. Like you'd have like a hundred cops going in a line and someone would pass a bucket down to debris and it would go down the line they started sorting stuff that way. Then when they realized like no one's getting out of this, they started coming in with the heavy equipment and uh, they sent this out to a dump out in Staten Island that had been closed for many years. And that's when like with heavy equipment, they were taking sections of, of debris. And since I worked in auto crime, they had us there with like fireman tools, like the jaws of life and stuff. And we would pull it open cars to make sure no one had perished in, inside these vehicles that had been crushed and, you know, pushed down into the lower concourse of the building. Wow. I mean, like everyone, I've seen it on television, the second tower. I've seen the second tower, the plane go into the second tower. I've seen uh, the collapse. I was I was supposed, I was at work and I, I had a group to do, but I did it because it was, that's what was needed. They needed that. The groups needed that. But I uh, remember the next day is what, was, what became real to me. I was standing downtown Denver waiting for a city bus to take me home. There wasn't a sound around me. There's no planes, no cars, no traffic, no yeah. nothing. There's nobody. And I'm just going. That's what brought it home to me. And I, the magnitude of the, of the, I mean, I seen it, but it, you know, like you, I felt like, what is it? This is, this is a movie. Yeah, the first week, you, you're a hundred, you know, so I hadn't thought of that. And you're a hundred percent right. Like the first week, or two. So you got to remember all the planes in the United States were grounded for about yeah. a week, right? Which is unheard of. And you're right. It was, it was quiet, even in New York, like people hunkered down. Like I remember, I remember like a day, you know, like the first week or two, like, you know, coming home and it was just so quiet. You're right. Like there wasn't a lot of people on the street. People had stocked up that first day, man. And nobody, even crime was down. We, we laugh about that now. Like the first, like crime was down, like you wouldn't believe in New York City. You would have thought like the opposite, like the criminals would have been like, well, the cops are down there. <laughs> Let's go have a party. And they didn't. I mean, you know, it was, it, it, crime was down. It was, it was, it was a different, people were actually nice in New York. Like you, you stop at a stop sign in New York. If you're not making eye contact with that guy, he's making that left in front of you. People are like, yeah, go ahead. You know what I mean? It was like, it was like everybody was nice. It was like being in a small town for about a week or two. Then everybody went back to you know being New Yorkers. Yeah, being typical New Yorkers. Yeah, I've I've, I've met a few of them over the years. I um, uh, that's interesting. Your your experiences down there. I mean, I've never I've talked to a couple of people. I talked to a lady was in my group as a matter of fact about a month after. Pentagon. She worked in the Pentagon. She was there when it happened. And I, I, she was in group for five months, so she did a lot of good work with her PTSD coming out of that. But other than that, I haven't talked to anybody really who's been there, who's seen it. And to, it was wild. Like I said, nothing, um, nothing could, could pre prepare you for it. And it was one of those things where I mean, for yourself or your listeners out there, when you, you when you're stuck doing something that's really unpleasant or you don't want to do, or you know, it's like, okay, this is really bad, but I got to get through this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I, I've got a job to do. I got to finish this. I can't go to pieces. Let let you know. Let's do it. You know what I mean? And I'll come out the other side. And that's that's basically what happened. I mean, for for all of us. Yeah, I don't know about police, but because the department I was with had two officers. 
and one cheap. <laughs> it was small. But firefighting, on the other hand, firefighters are crazy. Bottom line, they're just nuts. They'll do crazy things. They'll pull out a two and a half inch hose to put out a cigarette. I've seen them. We, we do things like that. We open dump tanks on people at six inch hole, six inch uh, pipe. And they'll open up that dump tank on top of it as you walk past them. It, I mean, we do crazy things like that. We'd shoot fire. My captain one time, I was over the hill. We were doing a control boat and I had a two inch hose down there. And had it set it, he had it set at 80 psi, and I he, he turned it on, and I opened up, opened it up, and sent out. And the pile just water split, just put me right on my keys to it. And my kids were watching this. This is what they did. So pile oh, so crazy. Hurt. Yeah, he he did it as a joke. He turned it on when I at 80. You know, I'd ask him to, you know, we talked about it. He said he'd put it at 20. But he seen my kids there, and he thought it'd be funny if they watched Daddy sit out. <laughs> they loved it. But the point is, do cops do things like that? Oh, cops play practical jokes on each other all the time. Um, I, I tell the story. Um, one time I was going out, it was towards the end of my shift I, in my office. And when you work in an office with detective, you, you, you're surrounded by trained eyes that don't miss a move. Right. And uh, someone had noticed I changed my slacks. And when I went up to get a cup of coffee, they soaked my chair with ice water. And I sat down and my butt was soaked and they're all laughing. I said, okay. I went down, I went upstairs, got changed. I went back downstairs across the street from our, uh, our uh, office was a, a pet store. I went in there and I bought a hundred crickets. I guess you feed snakes with those things. I put it in a plastic bag. I went into the parking lot. I found the, the ringleader of the group's car. I used the Slim Jim. I opened up the back door of his car. I cut the bag. Those things stink. And I dumped the crickets in the back seat of his car and I shut the door. The guy wound up having to sell the car. They kept breeding in there. So yeah. what happened was he would roach bomb the car from time to time and think he, think he killed him. And then one or two would have a party. And then they'd start chirping and jumping around his car. It was an old car. It was like an old 88 or whatever. But he wound up yeah. having to sell the car. <laughs> oh, 100 crickets. At least he didn't turn them loose in the precinct. No, no, that would that, that that would have been bad for business. But yeah, like that's a story from my book, The NYPD's Flying Circus. I think there's a chapter in there called Practical Jokers. Okay. And it's just all the stuff we used to like, we would play like when I was in uniform, you'd watch like a, one of your friends like radio car, they would go into the station house for an hour to take their meal hour. We'd break into their car, we'd pull the air vents off, we'd pour cornstarch down the AC vents, put the vents back, put the AC up on high. They get in the car and start it up and poof. They look like they worked in a bakery. Then they have, they have to go back into the precinct and get chained. We were always screwing around doing stuff like that. Yeah, that's that's good. I'm glad it was a camaraderie. Camarader? Camarader, yeah. No, yeah. We, it's, it's, you're 100% right. And the guys that couldn't take it, we left them alone. You know yeah. what I mean? Like you don't, you don't want to bully somebody. So if you could tell like someone really wasn't getting the joke, you're like, all right, he's a different kind of guy. Just leave yeah. him alone. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you really had some good friends. You still have friends on the department or you totally no, have you know it's it's so far I'm I'm writing another NYPD book now called and then there and and the last chapter is gonna be called and then there were none because yeah. my my a very good a guy I met in the police academy and for, for whatever reason he and I kept in touch for 35 years and uh he was the last one. He uh, actually reached out to me last summer. He's like, I retired. I'm like, really? And um it's so funny because in my uh, police academy, like I graduated with a group of 1,200, but like in my classroom, there were 2,700 of us. And I was going backwards, like trying to figure out what happened to everybody. And probably out of 27, only like probably 10 or 12 actually did 20 years or 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. Some went out on disability, um, a couple unfortunately you know died before their time a bunch got yeah. fired for different things some mm -hmm. left to go to different police departments you know what i mean so yeah. it's you know just attrition just attrition so you're not not connected to the department anymore so you can't you know like the tv shows everybody every retired cop or detective private detective well, has contacts no, I well, here's the thing i do have my ear to the ground and it's because of like like facebook so on facebook there's so many retired NYPD groups, right? Mm -hmm. And they got to know who you are. It's not like the average person, like, 
what they'll like say for argument's sake, I wanted to join a retired NYPD group. They'll post my photo and say, does anybody know this guy? Like, does any, can anybody vouch for who this guy is? Mm -hmm. And somebody, like, oh yeah, yeah, I worked with him. I worked with him in the 4-2 precinct. Oh yeah, he's a good guy. I worked with him in narcotic. And then they'll let you into the group. So uh, that's how I, you know, keep tracked of what's going on with the NYPD because a lot of these people, they have family that's still active. So yeah. that's how I get my information on what's going on in the department. Right. Close something up. And I am almost positive this is the way it is. In NCIC, you know, they got this, those C CSI crime shows. Yeah. They, yeah, that they solve the crimes rather than just do the scientific work at the crime scene. Is that true? What do you mean? Like the crime scene unit? The, the people that come yeah, in? And like... They don't solve the crime themselves. They don't go out and solve, find the killer or whatever, the public burglar. They just do the scientific work at the crime scene? Well, there's two levels of that, right? So... So we have in the NYPD, you have crime scene unit, right? Crime scene unit responds to the heavy stuff. Yeah. They're going to respond to homicides, um, someone seriously injured, likely to die, something that they know is going to be newsworthy and they want it handled correctly. Uh, if you and I are just patrol cops and we happen across a stolen car and we want the car fingerprinted, each borough has what's called an evidence collection team. Mm -hmm. So that's like a handful of cops that'll show up and they're going to handle things like a, a burglary. They'll dust for prints at a burglary mm -hmm. or a stolen car. They're not going to get involved in anything too heavy. The ones in crime scene unit have like the newest toys and gadgets oh, and yeah. stuff. And these people have been doing it for years. Um, what they basically, so say, let's say it's a homicide, right? Um, the first cop show, you know, the responding cops come, they go, uh oh, this is a homicide. Take a step back, secure the crime scene. You call the supervisor, you call the medical examiner, you start making your notifications. The precinct detectives will come. They're, they're going to step back. Crime scene's going to come, and then they're the ones that's going to spray luminol and do a fingerprint and, you know, do all that other stuff. Then once they've secured it, the medical examiner is going to come and he's going to say, okay, the body's going to the morgue. We're going to do an autopsy. Then the detectives start, precinct detectives start combing through that stuff. Yeah. If they don't have a suspect, um, it's different rules, but like in the NYPD, you have 12 precincts, right? So let's say we're talking about the Bronx. If there was a homicide committed in the 4-6 precinct, the 4-6 precinct detectives are handling this. If they don't have a suspect named within a week or two, now you have Bronx homicide. Those are detectives that strictly do homicide. They're brought in and they're going to work with them. And for the most part, everybody plays nice with each other because mm -hmm. they all know each other. And the reality is the precinct detectives at one time at one time or another are going to want to work in Bronx homicide. Yeah. So everybody, it's not like, well, you know, like a kid holding his candy bars, like you get into with different agencies and it becomes like a, a contest of who, who's got what information. There's a, they share you know, mm -hmm. so, and then if the case goes cold, it, it'll stay with Bronx homicide, and then those detectives work on other stuff. Okay, because yeah, I, I kind of thought that nonsense was pretty much nonsense with the CSI guys actually. No, they just the gather the evidence. No, yeah, they just yeah, gather the evidence. That's what I thought. I, I'm not all that dumb, but I just kind of, that's ridiculous. I don't watch the shows actually no. myself. I, I did for a while, but, and you worked auto theft for 10 years right auto detail for 10 years yeah yeah i was a detective in the auto crime division it was like you know um we, we go we would pick off the garden variety car thieves mm -hmm. you know to keep the numbers down but our mission was organized crime the mafia yeah. organized crews or gangs that were stealing cars in bulk okay that was your job was going after them not the yeah Oh, we would pick off data. the garden variety ones. Yeah, if a precinct was getting killed and the command, their commanding officer is like, listen, we're getting killed with five, six stolen cars a night. We, we would go up there and hunt those guys down, you know? Yeah. But for the most part, the patrol... What's a typical day like when you were in that division? Uh, for the most part, we did... Our, our hours were 9.30 in the morning till 6 at night, but it was a flexible schedule. So if we were working on a crew of guys... 
and we were up on wiretaps or we had a, a listening device or a tracking device in a bad guy's car. We basically were doing the hours that the car thieves were doing, right? Mm -hmm. Like I worked on one case, they were shipping 30 stolen vehicles a month to Shanghai. So we were, we were up all hours of the night chasing these guys around and we had we brought in detectives that spoke Mandarin and Cantonese that were monitoring the Chinese wiretaps. We had detectives brought in that were monitoring our car thieves who were Spanish wiretaps. And we were following these guys around. I actually, at one point, um, with, a, with a search warrant, stole one of the bad guys' cars. And we installed a listening and tracking device and put the car back in the middle of the night so it would be easier. We didn't want to get burned that they spotted us you know, with, with, with a listening and, and a tracking device in a car, you could sit back so that, you know, you don't get burned. Yeah. So it was, that's interesting that they were shipping that many cars a month to Shanghai. Yeah. Um, what it was is you had a Chinese military official. He was living in Brooklyn. He hooked up with a Jamaican middleman from the Bronx. And what he put in an order, of, they were 30 cars a month, sometimes more. They were they had to be Audis, A6, silver and black. And the Jamaican knew all these car thieves in the Bronx. So he had a, like it was like I'm, I'm dating myself with a Rolodex, but like he had a Rolodex of car thieves. Right. He had his favorites. And then he had guys, you know, if they were busy or something. So the Chinese guy was paying the Jamaican five thousand dollars an Audi. The Jamaican was keeping the lion's share of the money. He was paying his thieves between $500 and $1,000 a car. His main thief was this guy, Mario. And Mario was like a wrangler. Mario would pull guys out of bed. And they were stealing cars off the street. They were hitting car dealerships over the weekend, like taking five, 10 at a time. We knew we had a problem early because when, when you have like, like Honda Accords get stolen all the time because it's a common car and stuff. Yeah. But the cars will turn up chopped. They'll they'll sh sh turn up with the ignition punched or half a car. These things, these cars were vanishing off the face of the earth. So we knew they were getting shipped. We just didn't know where they were getting shipped. And what wound up happening was one of the thieves got caught in Rockland County trying to steal a BMW for another thing. And he was going back to jail. He didn't want to go to jail. He starts talking. So we did a joint case with the New York State Police and the Westchester County DA's office. If you ever watch Fox News, um, Judge Janine. Yeah. All right. So, so it was her office. Like I, I, I sat in on meetings with her. So it was okay. that was basically her office's case. We, it was a joint venture with the NYPD and the Westchester County District Attorney's Office and the New York State Police. So we were on wiretaps and, you know, so what the Chinese did was they had a, a warehouse in Brooklyn. So the cars would get stolen. They would get parked on the street for a couple of days to cool off to make sure they didn't have low jack or, uh, you know, a tracking device in it. Once they were confident the cars were clean and swept, several cars at a time would go first thing in the morning into this warehouse. So inside the warehouse, there'd be a shipping container. Two stolen Audis would go into a shipping container. They would let the air out of the tires so the car would sit low in the container. Then they would build a wooden platform above it and drive two other stolen cars in it. So they were putting between three and four stolen Audis per shipping container. Then the shipping container would get trucked by a legit company who had no idea there were stolen vehicles in these cars. They'd go out to Newark, New Jersey, where they were put on trains. Then they were railed across the United States to Long Beach, California, where they were put on ships. And then they were sent out to the Pacific Ring to Shanghai. So like we were we were up and running on this case. The cars were going out. You know, we, you know, we were we were on these guys. And what what became apparent was our car thieves were in the murder for hire business. So they start. They, I mean, they don't know what they're stealing cars. They're making money. They have no idea. We're listening to their phone conversation. And they start bragging about, yeah, I whacked this guy. I killed this guy. So now we're in the homicide business, right? So when the case came down, we solved or we pretty much had our finger on about 15 homicides. You know, I think I think we wound up being able to prove 10 or 13, but we were confident at least 15 that we knew about. And a lot of these guys went to jail for the rest of their lives. In addition for the auto theft case, a couple of the guys were wheelmen for these homicides. So 
you know, if, if you're, you're a getaway driver in a homicide, you're just as guilty as the guy that pulled the trigger. But the reality is they want the guy that pulled the trigger. So these guys did time eight, 10 years for their cooperation to testify against the trigger man. Right. Yeah, plea bargains, which is, I had no no qualms with those. You know, a lot of people do, but I had no problems with it. What got you into writing? I'm sorry? Why'd you start writing? I was bored. I retired from the NYPD. I moved down to Florida. I got a job with a small policeman, police department down here in Florida. I was bored out of my mind. And coming from you know, America's largest police department as a detective, and then going back on the road in my 40s, that's a young man's game. I didn't have the patience for the domestics and the DUIs. I was like, and then like in Florida, it's totally different. It's like having a stroke and having to learn everything all over again. So now like they're teaching me how to wrestle alligators. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm like, can't we just shoot these things? And they're like, no, you got to duct tape it. And I'm like, not getting involved in this. So I said, I better figure something out. Yeah. I was bored. And all my friends and family are like, you know how to tell a story. You got all these great stories. Why don't you start writing them down? And I, you know, I said, I didn't want, I said, if I'm going to write books about my prior career, I don't want to get anybody divorced. I don't want to get anybody in trouble or embarrassed because I'm not a sour grapes kind of guy. So I changed the names, the dates, the locations, but the stories are true. They just, I just move around what happened. Yeah. And I wrote one NYPD book and it started selling and I wrote another one and, you know, here I am into my sixth book. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. So you kind of just because you were bored, you started writing. It's kind of like how I got into poetry. That's how I got it. I started doing blogs to begin with and found out and discovered no, not many people were reading them. I know this is a waste of my time. So that's when I got into podcasts. You know, it, it, that's so true. You can have the greatest product, blog, podcast in the world. And if nobody knows about it, it yeah. just sits there. The onus is on the individual to go out there and promote yourself. And, and that's like what me and you were talking right now. Like people yeah. like yourself are nice enough to put me on your forum. And that moves books for me. And I get yeah. to meet a lot of people and it's opened up opportunities for me. There's a radio station. There's a radio guy uh, in New York and, and Philly. And as a result of doing these interviews every week, I'm on his show. Either he has me on live as a guest or every every week I cut a three minute story. So when he wants to take a break, he goes to one of my stories and that sells books for me. It's opened up opportunities. You bet. Well, when I do my show notes, I'm going to put the Amazon show link in there. So the, the link to the show, uh, Amazon books, just tell him, go to amazon.com and search up the book with your name. And get all these books. So I'm gonna, yeah, I do that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons I have you on the show is to help you out, so you can sell some books. No, you know? I, I appreciate it. And and my listeners, I, I my mainly is is history, but you've got a history here that I'm interested in. It's history repeating itself is basically what I'm doing. What I do, I'm doing. I just finished one on climate change. I got to record yet. Well, history does repeat itself. You're right. Yeah. So, what's it like in a crime scene? Say an auto theft. Let's keep it. Auto theft or a homicide? Homicide. Let's do homicide. Let's, let's, let's get more listeners. I, I've walked in. I've walked in on a couple of them. You want to hear a couple of me walking into a homicide story? Well, one of them anyway. Yeah. All right. Um, one time is the early '90s, and. Um, Walking out of the station house and a female cop hands me an address and she says, I don't know, this, it didn't come through 911. They called the precinct. It sounds like they're yelling in Spanish. I think it's a cardiac. So the guy I'm working with who was later killed, that's another story. He and I race up, race up. We get up to the six story walk up. We go into the apartment. There's people yelling and screaming. I'm kind of swimming through people. I get around to the kitchen. I see a pair of legs. There's a woman laying there. Her son's on top of her. There's blood all over the place. And mom, mom, mom. I tell the young man, come on, you got to get up. He gets up. The woman's covered in blood. Blood's all over the place. But you know, like, if you cut your finger, blood is bright red. Right. Blood was rust color brown, which means she's been there for a while. So yep. we take the young man. We sit him down on the couch. He's crying. He's hysterical. Looking around the apartment. It's been ransacked, right? So, like, 
when was the last time you saw your mother? And he's like, he went from being hysterical crying to measured. Like all of a sudden it was like, now he's repeating every question I ask him. Like, when was the last time you saw your mother? Um, when was the last time I saw my mother? I'm like, yeah, uh, about four hours ago. So he started getting weird. And we weren't putting the screws to him. We were just asking him basic questions. So the detectives come. They take him to the precinct. And you start looking around the crime scene. And now it's apparent that things have been staged. So when a burglar breaks into your house, they're dumping things out of drawers. They're not dumping things out of drawers and placing the drawers right back in nicely, no. right? Her bag is dumped upside down. The contents of her bag are all over the apartment. But the bag is put right side up and no one touched the credit card. So that was odd. It, it didn't make sense. No. So at the precinct, he's cooperating, but he's not saying much. And the woman had three brothers that lived in the building across the street. And the detectives told the brothers, listen, your nephew... We don't know if he did it or not, but it's obvious he knows more than he's saying. Uh, maybe you can get more out of him. And the young man, he didn't want a lawyer, but he wanted to go home. So the detective said, okay, you know, go. So they told him to go with his family, hoping to come back at six o'clock in the morning and get him again, right? Um, I had to guard the crime scene. The uh, crime scene unit came, you know, they took fingerprints around the blood. Um, there was no murder weapon. There just was blood all over the place. The following morning, um, the detectives, well, in, in the NYPD, when there's a homicide or someone dies, the responding cop has to fill out what's called a toe tag. It's a piece of oak tag with a little piece of string on it. You put your name, your information, the deceased information, and believe it or not, you tie it around the person's big toe. Mm -hmm. The following morning, that cop has to go to the morgue and ID the body for identification purposes. So the next morning I get up early, I go down to the morgue in the Bronx, skeleton crew, it's like a Sunday morning. I hand this kid that's working there the paperwork. He goes into this big refrigerated room, right? Wheels out a gurney, pulls off a sheet and there's a black guy. And I go, no, Hispanic female. And I show him the paperwork. He goes, okay. Throws the sheet over the black guy, wheels him back into the room, comes back a couple of seconds later, Pulls off the sheet. It's a male Hispanic guy. Looked like a wino. I said, what, 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 I mean, what, what, what is this, a joke? I said, I didn't come here to see everybody that died in the Bronx last night. I'm looking for her. I go, let me in there. So I walk into this refrigerated room. And there's like six or eight bodies on, on gurneys with sheets. And I recognize my handwriting off the toe tag. I pull the sheet off. It's the woman from the night before. I go, okay. I sign the paperwork. I leave. I go back to the office, um, to the detective's office, and they're all high-fiving each other, they're celebrating, and I see the guy in the cell. So obviously I knew, I go, what happened? The detectives got up the next morning, they go to the building to talk, to interview the guy again. When they get into the hallway, they hear yelling and shouting. The three brothers confronted their nephew the following morning, and they're yelling at him in Spanish. And thank God the detectives spoke Spanish. Like, what happened? You know more what's going on. And the, the kid confessed to his uncles in the hallway, and the detectives heard it. They brought him into the precinct. He repeated it. They locked him up. He's in jail now for like 30-something years. Uh, what happened was he was using drugs. The mother said, listen, I can't have you here no more. You're smoking crack. You're stealing from me. He came unglued, took a carving knife, stabbed her multiple times. She dies in the kitchen. He takes a shower, takes the knife, his bloody clothes, puts it in a plastic bag. He leaves the apartment to dispose of the evidence and leaves the door ajar, hoping that someone finds her. He comes back four hours later, no one's found her. People have seen him coming and going. Now he's locked in. So he gets on the phone and calls the precinct and says, hey, you know, whatever he says, and that's how I got involved. And then he calls his uncles, they come over and those, that was who was in the apartment. So, yeah, he killed his mother and he's been, this is going on about 28, 29 years. He's still in jail and hopefully he stays there for the rest of his life. Yeah, uh, that's highly intriguing. I mean, that's, you know, I get so tired of this. I don't watch television. I, I, just, I don't even have a TV. I, well, my monitor is a, is a TV, but all I use it for is a monitor. I don't watch, we don't have cable, we don't have net, so I don't watch these shows. Right. I don't watch any television, as a matter of fact. Well, a lot of them romanticize bad behavior. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or well, like you said, they got people believing that the people that collect the evidence are investigating these crimes, you know, mm -hmm. and they don't. You know, it's it's very, you know, I, I can speak for the New York City Police Department. It's very compartmentalized. Everybody's got their role and everybody's very good at their role. Yeah. You know, one of the questions you wanted that you were prepared to answer, they said, hey, well, it was about celebrities. Have you, did you meet any? I think it's a ridiculous question, but no, it's not. Think? No, oh yeah, no, that's not a ridiculous question. Um, if you work in New York City, especially if you're in Manhattan every now and then, like I was, you're gonna bump into famous people. There's a chapter in my book, um, the NYPD's Flying Circus. Um, the chapter is called Rubbing Elbows. Yeah. And oh, I've been, I've bumped into so many celebrities. I mean, I granted I was looking for it, but then there were other times I just ran into them. I remember one time it was the St. Patrick's Day parade. It's like '97, '98. Well, I'm in uniform, the parade's going by, and I see on the other side of Fifth Avenue, Columbo, the actor Peter Falk. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling my partner, I go, he goes, Columbo is right there. And he goes, oh, man. So the parade stops, and people are crossing Fifth Avenue. Peter Falk sees me making eye contact, puts his head down, and tries to get away from me. And we grabbed him, and I go, Peter Falk, we go, I love your show. And he's pretending like he's not Columbo. Finally, he goes, all right. What do you want? And we started talking to him and finally it's like, listen, I got a dentist appointment. I got to go. So, but it was funny. Like he, he talked to us for a couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> got to meet Julianne Moore. Uh, another time, Kevin Bacon. We scared Kevin Bacon. He was walking in the village in a track suit and he had like long hair and these wraparound sunglasses. And my partner goes, Kevin Bacon. And I go, that ain't Kevin Bacon. He goes, I'm telling you. So as Kevin Bacon was going to step into the street, we cut in front of him with our Jeep and he stopped and he saw the police radio and he goes, are you guys cops? And we said, yeah. And then he kind of leaned into the car and I go, I was just watching Mr. Grimble last night. He goes, did you like it? I go, yeah. And we were talking to him about his career. He was really a nice guy. Um, yeah. well, Tom I love it from Saturday Night Live. He was a really nice guy. Brad Garrett from Everybody Loves Raymond. Very mm -hmm. down to earth, funny, you know, just normal people. Yeah, I went, went into one that wasn't the nicest guy in the world. His name was John Denver. He was the nicest guy in the world, or um, he wasn't? In, you know, I don't know about it, but in the restaurant business I was in at the time, and he came into the restaurant I worked in, New Aspen, and he was not a nice guy, especially when he was loaded. Really. Yeah, I've heard stories from cops. See, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell them because I, I don't know if they're true, but I've heard yeah. stories from cops that worked in Manhattan dealing with some very famous people. Just like you said, yeah. they don't handle the liquor well and they're very belligerent. Mm -hmm. Climbing that you told me about that, that just a minute ago, was there anything else? Was there another one that really stands out that was connected to the city mobs in, in, in New York? Some of the crime families in New York. Oh yeah, um, my office. I, I, if I was like a tambourine player on, in a band on this case, mm -hmm. but uh, our main office had set up. Um, the mob is very big, or was in the auto theft industry because they own a lot of the junkyards, salvage yards, body shops, and they send out guys to steal cars. So there's a there was a neighborhood in Queens over by where Shea Stadium used to be. And, well, now it's City Field, and uh, right by LaGuardia Airport. And it, the whole neighborhood's called Willits Point. It was all glass places, junkyards, salvage yards. If you wanted to own a business in there, you had to deal with the mob. Like, the mob owned a lot of the businesses, but if you just wanted to open a place up, you couldn't just open a place up without having to kick up money to them and use their private sanitation company and their company that carts off waste oils and a lot of scam. Yeah. So... What, what our main office did was we rented a junkyard. We rented a place. They filled it up with, a, with, with abandoned cars and got equipment, and they started a junkyard. And John Gotti's son-in-law landed on them and, you know, do you know who I am? And you can't operate in here, and you got to kick up. And, you know, the place was wired for sound. So our, he stole, our office were paying him to operate and use his scams and everything. And, you know, when they took the case down, Gotti's uh, son-in-law got like eight or nine years. So, yeah, Gotti, I heard that name on more than one occasion. Yeah, he was already in jail. Um, yeah. He was already, I don't think he had died yet, but uh, but the son-in-law got snagged in that. 
Yeah, and his son, I guess, is in prison now, too. I don't know. No, the son's out. The son, the son out. supposedly is out of, as far as, you know, I hear and I read, as far as I know, the son is, you know, at, at, you know he's, he's done. He's, he's, he's done with it. It's the strangest thing that ever happened to you or you're a police officer. Oh, goodness. Um, strange, like, brutal, strange, like, I mean, there's, no two days are like in the NYPD. You walk into one thing thinking it's something. I, I could give you story after story after story. Um, early in my career, towards the end of my shift, um, we see a fire truck putting out a small fire with a car. Um, little Toyota Corolla, it's like 1988, 1989 was on this road by by the dump and they're putting out this uh, this fire it's an interior fire and it was a newer toyota corolla we figured it was an insurance fraud someone burning their car yeah. and uh the fire department you know they're putting out the fire and um they're taking the plates off the car and um we're just talking to the firemen right let them do their job and i'll never forget they pop open the trunk of this little toyota corolla there's two guys in the trunk duct tape and shot multiple times and one guy is blinking right he's, he's still alive like oh shit so one guy's dead the other guy's blinking take him out of the car we pull off the duct tape and it was wild he he later died but the thing is whoever did this they were still alive in the trunk because we found shell casings so picture that you're in the trunk of a car duct taped and two grown men in a toyota corolla like they were yeah. shoved not a big trunk not like you'd want to be in a cadillac trunk you never want oh, to be in a trunk. yeah but these two poor guys are laying stacked like wood shoved in this car they opened the trunk shot him multiple times i think it was a 22 shot yeah. him multiple times shut the trunk set the car on fire and took off yep wow that would be that would definitely be at the end of your shift <laughs> oh uh, do you want to hear another another, another homicide story yeah, we got about six minutes left. Okay, early 90s, slow night, it's pouring rain out, domestic violence call comes over, one radio call goes, since it's slow, another radio call says, yeah, we'll back him, right? A couple of seconds later, the dispatcher says, multiple calls on this, so now me and my partner go, three radio calls go. The first radio call shows up, they don't pull up in the front of the building, they pull off to the side in the back of the building. As they get out of the car, they hear screaming coming out a window. Uh, it was like three-story garden apartments, but what, and it was raining out. For whatever reason, these two cops climb up the fire escape where they hear screams. They look in the window. There's a woman laying on the floor, and there's a guy with a butcher knife basically decapitating her. These two cops start yelling and screaming into the radio. Now the cavalry's coming, right? We get to the front of the building. We hear like six shots go off. We're coming up the stairs now into the building. There's a 13-year-old kid running down the stairs. He's screaming. He's killing my mother. He's killing my mother. We get up to the apartment. We're pounding on the door. We're going to kick the door in. We hear our two co-workers now inside the apartment screaming, don't shoot, don't shoot, because they're afraid we're going to shoot through the door because we heard the shots when we pulled up. They open the door. It's like somebody lit a pack of firecrackers off in the apartment with all the gunfire. It's like all the gunpowder is in the room. It's like fireworks off, right? As we're walking around the apartment, our feet are just sticking in the floor in blood, right? What it was is it was a domestic. The guy lost his mind. He took a hammer and destroyed everything in the apartment, stabbed her multiple times. Um, this part of her neck was missing. I mean, just the amount of blood was just incredible. We just, again, we were walking in it. Um, the look of horror in her face, like in the movies, people's eyes are closed when they die. Like, no, like I could picture this 30 something years later. Um, while he was decapitating her, the two cops were banging on the window trying to break the glass to get in through there. He turns around, hears them, grabs the butcher knife and goes, oh, you want some of this? Runs, throws open the window, and he starts lunging out the window with two of my coworkers. Back then we had 38s, which 38s pack a punch. The, the two cops up close like unload on him and send him back into the apartment. He goes stumbling back, falls backwards, the knife comes out of his hand and goes into the kitchen. And my friend is telling me the story. Like, we're in the apartment. He's like, the knife fell out of his hand and shot back into the room. I go, dude, this is a good shooting. Don't even worry about that. 
I took the two cops that 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 killed the guy to the hospital to get checked out. And the wild thing is we're in the hospital. These guys are like really upset. And the cop reaches down and touches his leg. The guy, when he was swinging out the window, cut his pants, but didn't because like cops don't NYPD cops. We don't go to the tailor. If you ever watch the next time you see NYPD cops, everybody's got baggy pants because they're too cheap to go to the tailor. The knife went right through his knee, but didn't touch it. Didn't touch his kneecap. Wow. So, you know, she awesome. was dead, unfortunately. And, and, you know, and they they killed the guy in the apartment. Well, yeah. I, um, uh, just amazing. It's just really amazing. We got about three minutes here, two minutes here. I just want to say thank you, Vic. You've been a marvelous guest. Uh, about a oh, week for me to edit this and get it uploaded. And I'll send you a through podcast. A link to where to be. Okay. Yeah, please Not do podcast. that. Pod, I'll, I'll, yeah, pod match. And you can yeah, no, yeah, or email me the um the link and I'll, I'll promote it on all my social media platforms. I, I appreciate yeah. the opportunity. That'll work out because I, I like I say I'm gonna promote it on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter are the three places I do most of my promoting on. Plus my show notes will be on there. Okay, yeah, and I'll send you my Amazon book link to make it easy for you. That'll work. That'd be fantastic. That'll make it easier for my listeners to go to and get your books. So, Vic, okay. thank you. Thank you again. You've been a marvelous guest. I'm glad to keep it, keep keep yourself safe and then keep writing. Thank you so much, Dale. I appreciate it. Have a good weekend. You betcha. You too. Thank you for listening to the show. There are show notes and a place to comment at https colon forward slash copy dash time dash in dot lips and dot com forward slash website he hopes that you liked what you heard and will tell others about him dale is attempting to get a following that both disagrees and agrees with him he does not want yes men if you disagree wonderful he is happy to have you here as a part of the copy time again team dale does not talk about the news of the day he is attempting to give a history lesson that is just as important about what is going on in the headlines of today. Please do not hesitate to contact him. Just remember that Dale wants a clean show, meaning no cussing, name calling, yelling, or hate aloud. You can disagree with him and not be disagreeable about it. Support him and keep help keep this alive. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash glow dot fm forward slash coffee dash time and dash again <laughs>